good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our panel, The Power of Unmanned Systems. Uh, as you've all heard, our next generation of fighters and bombers are envisioned as families of systems that incorporate autonomous, collaborative aircraft, or ACPs. ACPs will augment the capabilities of our most modern aircraft. While exactly how these aircraft might look is still not clear, these ACPs will need to have a high level of autonomy and a variety of capabilities to make them work in highly contested environments and at range. We also know that Secretary Kendall has placed a premium on buying large numbers of ACPs at lower costs. Today, we have three perfect guests who are at the forefront of unmanned technology that will derive the developments of these systems moving into the future. Joining me today are Dr. Stephen Bird, Mark Steiner, and Matthew George. Let me tell you a little bit about the gents here. Dr. Bird is Chief Engineer for Pratt & Whitney Advanced Military Engine Programs, otherwise known as Gator Works. Steve has a 24-year tenure at Pratt & Whitney with leadership roles and applied experience across numerous military engine platforms that extend across the product lifestyle from concepts to sustainment. In the middle, Mark Steiner is a direct, Senior Director of Strategic Business Development at Elbit America. Elbit is a high technology company engaged in a wide range of programs, primarily in defense and homeland security areas. Steiner spent 22 years in the U.S. Army as a retired colonel and he also retired out of the job as military deputy for the Army's Communications Electronics Research Development and Engineering Center. And finally, Mr. George is the CEO of Merlin Labs and a good friend. Merlin Labs is developing autonomous flight technology that works with existing aircraft. Prior to Merlin Labs, Mr. George founded and led Bridge. Now Bridge is a platform that supports AI enabled mass transportation. So thank you all three of you for joining us today. And I'd like to get started by uh, allowing you to make some introductory remarks from each of you on how your companies fit in to the overall picture for UAS. So uh, uh, we'll start with Dr. Bird. All right, well, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, let me start by saying, you know, unmanned systems are playing an important role in terms of how we operate in the sky today. And uh, as alluded to by the introduction, that role and the importance of unmanned systems is just gonna continue to grow uh, and, and carry more relevance. Uh, at Pratt & Whitney, we're proud uh, to be the power and propulsion provider for unmanned systems today. And uh, with that horizon in front of us, you know, we are positioning ourselves to, to meet some of the challenges uh, that we see facing as we start to uh, deploy more of these systems uh, out there. Um, at Pratt, there's a couple of things we're really focused on at the moment. Uh, the first is continuing to support those unmanned systems that are flying today. Uh, there's a sustainment element to them, and as they uh, continue to operate, you know, we are seeing the needs for additional capability, and we're working hard to uh, bring forward new technologies and capability to enhance those platforms. Uh, we have established uh, a number of years back a uh, group that we affectionately call the PIG, <laughs> Platform Integration Group, whose sole purpose is to work with the weapon systems contractors, non-traditional and traditional, to find ways that we can leverage our commercial off-the-shelf products to best suit those applications. Uh, beyond that, on the technology side, you know, we are using agile development to find the capabilities that provide the most uh, enabling uh, aspects of these future designs and building the, the new solutions uh, that can be leveraged in these air vehicles in the future. This includes uh, scalable architectures uh, that will uh, allow for the greatest leverage uh, across platforms and, and economies of scale. And lastly, uh, many of these systems to really achieve the mission uh, objectives that are out there, they need disruptive capabilities. And that's a big focus in my area specifically 
where we are trying to figure out what game-changing uh, capabilities in the integrated power propulsion and thermal side uh, are needed and trying to ready those uh, as quickly as we can uh, going through technology maturation and demonstration. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, certainly I think uh, you know, this is a very relevant topic and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Dr. Burt. Mark Steiner. Thank you. As a former Army aviator, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here at AFA and to be part of this panel. I thought I'd start by just taking a minute to talk about three trends that we see in the unmanned system space and then touch super briefly on where Elbit America is investing to meet those trends. The first is increased lethality. I think armed drones are not new, drone strikes are not new, but I think what you're seeing now is a massive proliferation of weaponized unmanned systems. I think everything from you know first person viewer drones that you buy off the shelf uh, to, to larger systems that are actually employing anti-tank weaponry, you're seeing a, a, a massive number of, of lethal unmanned systems. If you just kind of look back at the evolution of, of unmanned systems, I think predominantly they were ISR systems, right? I mean, they, we, we've had drone strikes, but now I think there's a, a huge investment happening globally in weaponized UAVs. The second trend is one to many. So I, I think if you look at what's happening today, what you primarily see are remotely piloted systems. We talk about unmanned systems. Largely, they're remotely piloted. You tend to see one operator or pilot controlling one platform. Maybe in some cases, uh, for the larger, more complex systems, you'll have two operators controlling a single platform. But with the proliferation of increasingly large numbers of lower cost systems, what you're going to have is one operator controlling multiple platforms. So that's going to drive the autonomy that we talk about. We, you know, kind of everybody agrees that there's going to be increased autonomy. I think one of the things that's going to drive that trend is the fact that you have one operator controlling multiple systems. So they need to be able to react uh, many more things without, without the operator uh, intervention. And, and then the third trend is control from the cockpit or, or the fighting platform. I think, again, when you look around today, predominantly the systems are controlled uh, from, far, from off and far away, but certainly by dedicated operators in a dedicated uh, command shelter. And the way those, and, and that, that traces back to their lineages and ISR systems. So you have a dedicated operation cell that's operating these things and then communicating with the people who are directly engaged in the battle. And I think that paradigm will shift. I think in conflicts of the future, what you're gonna see because of the immediacy, because the systems are lethal, weaponized, and integrated as part of the actual fighting that's happening, they're gonna be controlled directly from the cockpit, from the, from the land platform um, across the board. And so Elbit is investing to, to meet these trends. We're making large investments into the sixth gen cockpit and how future pilots will be able to control the aircraft uh, while operating and interacting with a large number of systems. We're building new platforms and we're building a number of electronic warfare and other payloads to, to support those platforms. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Matt George. Hey guys, good afternoon. All right, there we go, we're still alive after lunch. Uh, my name is Matt, I lead up Merlin. Uh, unlike some of my colleagues, you guys may not have heard of Merlin, so a little bit about us. We're a growth stage aerospace startup, primarily based out of Boston, uh, but we've got a big group in Denver, Colorado, Los Angeles, and a flight test facility in Mojave, California. So if you're ever in the, uh, if you're ever in the neighborhood, please uh, look us up and uh, we'll, we'll have you out and come see some autonomous aircraft. And then we have an incredible group in New Zealand uh, where we've partnered with the New Zealand government uh, to deploy the world's first nation level uh, autonomous air cargo network. I always joke to folks that I get to live every little kid's dream, uh, which is being able to go build technology and systems to make giant flying robots. Uh, but one of the things I think we should really talk about today, and I think has been a conversation throughout um, at least sort of the past AFA and this AFA, is being able to take autonomous systems from the future tense and bring them into the present tense. So instead of saying what we will be doing or what we want to be doing, uh, being able to bring that back to the present tense and saying what are we doing to make meaningful steps to be able to go get there. At Merlin, we're now leading the space, um, deploying you know, $150 million uh, to be able to go develop autonomous systems in the future. First, uh, taking large airplanes and going from two pilots down to one. Uh, so we're developing a system that acts as a co-pilot on a very, very large aircraft. We announced a couple months ago that we were selected to be able to go bring crew reduction to the C-130J uh, in partnership with uh, our friends at AFSOC uh, uh, and SOCOM. 
uh, and then being able to go take that pilot and eventually then power totally uncrewed flight. Uh, so we're really proud of the work that we're doing, especially on the civil side, where we announced the world's first certification basis for takeoff to touchdown autonomy, including the only time ever uh, that there's been a certification basis issued on a truly non-deterministic autonomous system as opposed to a rule-based system. So we're really excited to be here, really excited to be able to go continue the conversation about how to take autonomy from the future tense and bring it back into the present tense. Very good. Thanks, Matt. Well, let's uh, dive a little bit further into this topic. And uh, when we uh, think about near-peer competition, uh, what comes to mind in today's world, a lot of, lot of problems, but mass is one of them. And uh, we need capacity of all types of aircraft to be able to compete, to fight and win against a peer. So I'd ask you all, um, what, why is, first of all, why is mass important? And then how might ACPs help with the balance of mass in our favor? And I'll start with you, Matt. Yeah, great. As everybody here knows, we, in a near-peer competitive environment, we're not just talking about one aircraft type, we're talking about multiple aircraft types. So as folks like General Pringle and, and General White have talked about pretty extensively, being able to go say, we only have one type of aircraft that's able to fly autonomously is not enough to be able to go support the warfighter. One of the things that we're most excited about is taking a pilot and making an autonomous pilot that can be applied to a wide variety of aircraft. Um, so as some of you are, are pretty well aware, we are taking that concept and applying it to a wide variety of missions, starting first with cargo and, and refueling and then accelerating it from there. So when we talk about mass, especially in the near-peer competitive fight, we're not just talking about massive aircraft, but we're talking about massive mission types where we can be able to go deploy autonomy to refuel, to resupply, and free up our, our very precious human pilots to be able to go perform those high cognition missions that are best performed by a human and taking those missions that can be performed best by autonomous systems, the dull, dirty, and dangerous missions, and enabling those to be flown by an autonomous system. And we're, we're really excited to have an aircraft agnostic autonomy platform where we can put it into everything from you know, a very low cost King Air, where we're working in partnership with companies like Dynamic Aviation out of, out of uh, Virginia on their King Air platforms, all the way up to highly sort of exquisite new aircraft like the C-130J, and then some future platforms as well. So when we think about mass, we're not just thinking about mass in terms of the number of aircraft, but we're thinking about mass in terms of the missions and the types of aircraft that can be powered by autonomy. Hey Matt, we'll circle back on autonomy in a second. It'd be pre pretty interesting, but uh, but Mark, over to you for a discussion of mass and how ACPs might help that. I think one of the things about mass is it needs to be affordable. Um, I, I think one of the things that that we're seeing, you know, in in Ukraine is uh, the the Russians. They had some some good equipment, we think, but they didn't have enough of it, and it wasn't sustainable. Uh, to, to, to deal with the conflict that they're in. So I think when you think about mass, it, it's gotta be producible, it's gotta be affordable, it's gotta be trainable, and it's gotta be sustainable, or, or it's not gonna be relevant at the end of the day. Not very good. Steven? Yeah, I think there's a good points made here. I, I meant, uh, like you said, ACPs, you know, it's plural. There, there will be different uh, levels of autonomy. There will be different mission sets required of these vehicles. So we're talking large numbers. And uh, I'll say as a nation, we have to find uh, a way, whether through affordability or whatnot, to, to find a means to uh, produce these in the quantities uh, that, that we need, you know, within some of the financial constraints we have. Uh, now, with that said, we know our pure adversaries are producing these in large quantities as well. and. Uh, why do we need them? Well, a couple respects. Uh, defensive. You know, if our peer adversaries have quantities, well, we need to be able to uh, interrupt uh, any attacks that they have on their end. Having large quantities of uh, various systems uh, is a good enabler to, to help uh, prevent the effectiveness of those attacks. Similarly, on the offensive, it's, um, you know, just it's all probabilities and, and effectiveness. You know, if we have enough of these quantities to uh, perform the right missions with the right capabilities, that will allow us to increase our probabilities and effectiveness on the offensive side. Thirdly, they're about protecting our pilots. We want our pilots to come home safely. And if you can couple the crewed aircraft with uncrewed aircraft, that's a big step in the right direction to allowing that uh, capability to happen. 
Um, in addition, these platforms uh, offer up new opportunities to battle uh, in, the, in the war space, including special operations, um, and just by the mass, just bringing the confusion and the uncertainty we need to maintain an advantage in the battlefield. Um, you know, it's a complex situation. There's a lot of needs out there. We'll have to find that path. But uh, at least from our perspective, uh, the advantages in going this direction are very clear. Very good, Doctor. Hey, Matt, I'm going to come back to you here because uh, there's been a lot of talk about research and, and just figuring out what ACPs might look like. Uh, it's, it's not real clear. Uh, we had a workshop at Mitchell Institute for the audience not too long ago where we talked about ACPs. We had a number of experts in. Very interesting workshop with some tremendous insights. Will you, Matt, at Merlin, you were saying you're building autonomy software uh, to allow larger aircraft to operate independently. What's the state of autonomy technology? How could it be used for war fighting? Uh, is it close, far, where is it at? So I'll be controversial and say far. Uh, so I think if, if we had the ability to be able to go back and look at the last, I don't know, 15 years of, of AFA where we talk about, you know, what the future of, of truly autonomous collaborative aircraft could look like, we've sort of been putting up the same slides for, for a really, really long time. I think what I'm most proud of about the work that we're doing at Merlin, especially in collaboration with our, with our partners at AFSOC uh, and SOCOM, is being able to go take sort of the first baby steps in order to be able to go get there. So for those of you who are, who are pilots in the room, uh, there's a pretty gradated process to be able to become a pilot. Uh, we don't first start you out and throw you in a, you know, in a dogfight uh, with, with another fighter aircraft. We start with uh, you know, basic piloting skills. So what we're doing at Merlin about building an autonomous co-pilot allows us to be able to go build a pilot and gain tens of thousands of hours of trust in that pilot as the second required crew member aboard an aircraft with a human pilot sitting by its side, able to be able to go safely take control of the aircraft. If we make this binary step to full autonomy, where we're taking you know, a large amount of aircraft uh, you know, and, and putting it out sort of into the world and saying, you know, it's gotta be perfect, uh, then we're gonna be in a position where it's never gonna be perfect and we're never gonna fly anything and we're never gonna field anything and our near peer competitors are gonna continue to accelerate their, their, uh, their, their progress against us. So my opinion, um, and I know is, is an opinion that, that other people may not share, um, but being able to go bring autonomy into like very real steps by putting it into the cockpit of an Air Force aircraft, getting it up in the air and then starting to build that experience actually on the aircraft as opposed to sitting and showing PowerPoints and renders and videos of what it could look like and actually demonstrating what it can look like trained and trusted by a human pilot in the left seat. Giddy up, Matt. Thank you. That's good. Uh, let me let me seg a little bit here to uh, talk about uh, solving the range and payload issue. And Dr. Bird, you're familiar with this. Uh, given the premium that's being placed on lower cost and mass, what's Pratt & Whitney doing to balance this capability with lower costs? What are the trade-offs? Yeah, without question, uh, affordability is going to be a big part of the, the, the equation. Um, you know, we're going to have to continue to strive to find ways that the uh, air systems and the power and propulsion that uh, are inherent to them, um, you know, find their way through business cases and, and uh, you know, manifest themselves in the way that we, we can procure these uh, systems in, in large quantities. Um, but there's a but. Um, you know, what I'll say is, you know, engine systems are not always uh, a commodity. Um, in some cases, they're, they're being treated that. But when you look at these systems, as we just mentioned here, you know, these systems will have different capabilities needs. They will have different mission sets. Uh, you know, all of these uh, different aspects, these requirements, these uh, ability that uh, we're going to be looking for from these systems do provide some differentiation that has to be uh, recognized. Now, with that said, when you do look at these systems, and I'll just kind of speak from the engine side, is, you know, the low-cost model maybe does work for some systems. If you're looking at uh, uh, a low-cost decoy, 
where the, the capabilities are uh, very focused in terms of you know, getting a, a missile system uh, to a destination over a, a certain time and, 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 and distance. Um, you know, there could be opportunity for a, a low cost paradigm for those types of systems. Um, but as you look at more sophisticated systems, you know, that's where the cost challenge becomes uh, a little bit more difficult when you're looking for capability um, that actually costs some money to develop and to deliver. So we're, we're very focused, I'll say, on both ends uh, at this point in time. You know, we look at uh, some of our, our smaller and mid-size engine platforms uh, that will be, you know, prime candidates in the near term uh, for these ACPs. And we're working very hard uh, to find ways of, of continuing to re reduce uh, the cost of the systems through different uh, uh, approaches with uh, manufacturing, uh, supply chain, uh, different design features, um, trying to add value to them to get more capability out of the same systems. And then on the far end, you know, these systems, when you look at the fact that they're going to be going into contested airspace, uh, require uh, you know, significant power levels to uh, uh, accomplish the missions that they need for the sensors and the other systems. You know, that's where, you know, some large companies like ourselves, we do have some differentiating capabilities and uh, it's really the onus on us is to continue to mature those capabilities so that they're ready and uh, they're ready in a way that uh, doesn't break the bank. You know, there, there's a value with that. And, uh, you know, that's really our challenge to make sure that uh, we're bringing forward the value that the, uh, the customer is willing to pay for at the end. Um, so, again, you know, different systems, different cost models, uh, you know, we recognize that. But uh, you, you got to play the spectrum here, and that's uh, some of the challenge that uh, I think we're facing as a whole. Oh, very good. Let me ask uh, Mark you a question because you've got some experience in this. Uh, one way that is envisioned to use UAVs uh, is in a swarming behavior uh, or tactic, as you want to call it. There are not too many options to defend against this, and you're working in that, Mark, uh, uh, at Elbit. Um, you're a lead for, I guess, the swarming UAS and counter UAS uh, initiatives. Uh, can you tell us about that current state of play and are swarms a reality? Can we defend against them? Thanks. Uh, well, swarms are a reality. I mean, I think we're seeing one of the things people are doing um, to overwhelm defenses is uh, simply to employ large numbers of systems to, to, to you know, to defeat countermeasures. El Elbit America really got into the counter UAS business as part of our border security program. Um, I know this is AFA. Maybe people in this audience don't know the company that way, but um, Elbit America has been involved in uh, security for a number of years as a, as a prime contractor along our border with Mexico. And we're seeing a large number of uh, commercial, low cost drones uh, being employed by our adversaries in the border. And we've got a number of systems deployed down there to defend against those and they're highly effective. When, when you look at low cost uh, drones, um, or frankly, any remotely piloted drone, right? I said earlier, today today what you're primarily seeing are remotely piloted vehicles. So remotely piloted vehicles, the easiest way to attack them is to attack the data link, right? If, if, if you're remoting control of that, uh, th those, those, those data links, they're, they, they're making emissions, they can be detected, they can be targeted, they can be defeated. That's, that's being done, that's an affordable thing to do, um, and it's a highly effective defense at the moment. I, th I think what we'll see, if you if you look at the trend, um, I think you'll see sort of an investment, counter-investment, counter-countermeasure. I think that the, the unmanned systems, you know, this is where you get into the autonomy, right? Because the data links, the remotely pilot aspect is, is the easiest way to defeat them, you're going to see platforms in the future that operate without that remote piloting, without a data link that can, and so right. now your primary method of defeating them is, is, is degraded, right? So now you have to be able to physically detect them Probably you're going to need active sensors to actually detect them, uh, but you have to be able to physically detect them without their own emissions, and you have to be able probably to kinetically defeat them. Um, 
So, so this is where this is where El Elbit's investing, right? We're looking at high energy lasers to attack the target. We're making major investments into new active sensors like radars, which can track thousands of targets simultaneously and provide firing solutions so that they can be targeted and, and defeated. I think that's the swarm of the future is, is gonna be large numbers of vehicles that have to be detected, tracked, and defeated all in a very short amount of time. Yeah, yeah we need that for base defense, so hurry it up if you would. Uh, so we see a lot of countries now who want to have this capability. Uh, you know, you see uh, an explosion of UAVs. Uh, we're, they're talked about in Gordon, Karabakh, Syria, of course, Ukraine and Russia. We see what's going on there. Uh, even Taiwan is stepping big into this. So I'd like to ask all three of you your thoughts about if you're a new entrant as, as a country, as a nation, into the world of UAVs, uh, what do you need to be prepared to, to do? You know, what do you have to have in order to use this technology effectively? I'll start with you, Matt. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer to, to my, my two colleagues who, who work a little bit more closely on, the, on that end of the spectrum. But one of the things that we've talked about, is particularly with, with some of our partners at the Air Force, is being able to go use the Air Force's existing advantage. So, you know, the Air Force that we built is the best Air Force in the world. So how can we take those assets that we already have and enable those assets to fly with high degrees of autonomy, with like structural barriers for a new entrant to be able to come and compete with us one-to-one -one for, for those autonomous capabilities. Whereas on the smaller end of the spectrum, we have seen throughout the world the ability for state and non-state actors to be able to go match us or get pretty close to matching us one-for-one -one on smaller systems. Yeah, Mark, how about it? So a lot of our work is with the, the smaller systems, you know, that I've, that, that's kind of where a lot of my comments are. And I guess the, the, the alarming answer to your question of, of what does it take to get in the business of, of uh, unmanned aircraft is not a lot, right? I think what we're seeing is, is that um, it's pretty easy to get off the shelf technology, which is very readable, readily available at low cost and, and put weapons on them. I mean, one, one of the most effective things that, that I'm seeing happening is just taking first person viewer racing drones that uh, you know, a lot, lot of people here may, may operate and uh, putting, putting explosives on them and flying them right into targets. It requires very little technology, it requires very little money. Um, it's very, you know, it requires no training. These things are, are just bought by people and used e every day. So, and, and, and they can be done in, in, in high numbers. So this is what we're seeing is one of the reasons that I think we're gonna see a lot of need investment in encounters to those types of, of low-cost systems. Yeah, very good. Dr. Burke? Yeah, I think uh, both of you spoke uh, well about the, the, the small side. I'll just kind of go a little bit to the, the larger side. And um, I'll bring it a little bit to kind of what I'm seeing here domestically. There's been a, a pretty large appetite, uh, you know, for new companies, new entrants uh, to, to try to en enter the market that, um, you know, on one side, it's been uh, very interesting seeing uh, the innovation that's uh, coming forward from from some of those. Um, but on the on the flip side, we're we're also seeing a lot of mixed results. In that, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of interesting concepts out there, uh, interesting prototypes and, and the like. And I'll say to your question, kind of uh, maybe the challenge here for for, for us. Uh, for the United States and, and the like is that, you know, when you look at these larger systems, you know, getting that design, that concept designed forward, that's the easy part. To actually get a system out there that can work, that can function, that's where, you know, there's a, a lot of important know-how out there within our industry today to make sure that the subsystems work, that the integration works, that we can deliver a system that can achieve its mission, has the endurance, the durability, um, you know, that can actually be produced at a high rate, you know, with the capability we need. So I, I kind of bring this forward that, uh, you know, there is a differentiation between uh, the small side and uh, maybe the higher, larger side, higher value type ACPs, where I think, uh, you know, there's uh, really a good opportunity to take advantage of what uh, some of the new entrants are doing and getting them kind of married with some of us in the OEMs to take some of those great vision concepts and make them a reality to help fill the, 
the void that we see as we look forward to bringing forward, uh, you know, a whole family of ACPs. Yeah, yeah, very good, thank you. Well, let's, let's go back to ACP technology, and I want to ask all of you, and I'll start with Matt. Um, some of this technology is available today. Uh, Matt, you said a few minutes ago some of it's way out there a bit. A bit. Um, but what are some of the major milestones or obstacles we'll have to overcome uh, to move forward with the technology we need for this you know, notion of ACPs supporting other aircraft and uh, maybe even operating independently? Uh, so in other words, in five to 15 years down the road, where are we gonna be with this technology, Matt? All of the technology problems for being able to go deploy a, you know, a large, large aircraft autonomously, and when I say autonomously, I mean an aircraft, it's able to go think on its own, not operated by a remote operator, you know, in sort of a linkless environment. There are some massive technology barriers that we still have to be able to go get there, but there's no, you know, break, a, break glass of physics technology problems in there. The problem, at least in our opinion, uh, and in my opinion, that, that I've seen the most is the willingness of both the defense sector as well as the commercial sector to make small incremental progress along that pathway to be able to go get there. I think we often hang our hats on these huge technology problems of what if, what if, what if. And by doing lots of studies and by doing a lot of you know, talking, we're not actually out there going and flying and we're not actually substantially de-risking the problem. So if you know, somebody had a magic wand or if I had a magic wand, which is a dangerous thing, you don't want me with a, a magic wand, I promise. Okay. But if I had a magic wand, one of the things that I would do uh, in order to be able to go like meaningfully move this along is to create you know, 24 month milestones of saying, how can we get autonomy onto an Air Force aircraft? And General Slife at, at AFSOC has been a really big proponent of this where he's given us a you know, 24 month time horizon to be able to go start to bring autonomy onto um, you know, large Air Force aircraft and be able to go meaningfully demonstrate it. So by doing that, we can make so much more progress than if we you know, do what we continue to do, which is really just you know, think about it and delay instead of actually going flying, iterating, and flying again. Yeah, Mark. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> so, so I think when you talk about ACP, uh, the C is for collaborative. Um, and so collaborative is, you know, it's, it's two-way, right? I mean, and so we've really, so far, we've been talking a lot about the platforms, the unmanned platforms, and what they're going to do, and the autonomy that they're going to have, and how they'll make decisions, and what payloads they'll have. But there, there's also the collaboration, which is the actual pilots, right? Pilots aren't going away by any stretch. Like, I think the future battle space is definitely going to need pilots. I think the airspace is going to be very crowded with large numbers of vehicles, right? You, you're going to have a huge number of friendly uh, manned and unmanned vehicles and a lot of enemy manned and unmanned vehicles. And so one of the areas that, that, that we're doing a lot of investing, thinking, talking to our partners in the Air Force about is what does the cockpit look like? What, what kind of sixth gen systems do you need as a pilot to be able to visualize that very crowded battle space, right? How can you understand what large numbers of things are doing at any point in time and then be able to provide direction often to many of the friendly ones, right? Based on, based on your understanding, how do you control those things, employ those things while still fighting the aircraft that you're in? And so uh, th that's, that's really, I think, one of the challenges that we'll have to solve before we reach the desired end state. Yeah, very good. And, and uh, how about trust? Trust in these systems by those pilots. Yeah, trust is a big one. I think it's going to be incremental, you know, I, I think you, you were talking about that. I, I think what will, um, in general, progress tends to be more incremental than, than, than revolution, re revolutionary technology. I, I think we'll begin to see things that are autonomous, but, but maybe not... Uh, maybe not machine learning vehicles that are adapting and making all their own decisions. I, I, I think uh, as, a, as a pilot and talking to pilots, I think pilots really want systems they can team with that they understand and can predict, right? I think you want systems that have a high degree of capability, but are really operating on some autonomy uh, algorithms that you can understand and predict until you get more comfortable with them. Uh, as a teammate, this is this is the way I think it'll work, and of course, it's going to require some robust cyber protection as well. No, I appreciate that, Dr. Berg. Back to that question about uh, what obstacles are out there to get to the technology we need. 
Yeah, I think uh, to a good extent we're still trying to figure out, you know, what what ACPs are and and what we can do with them and what we want to do with them. Um, you know, I think there's some really good dialogue, some some uh, you know very good progress out there with a, a couple of platforms that uh, there's been you know company investment in, there's been government investment in to kind of really show what that that capability uh, might offer. Um, but to a good extent, you know, we're not moving at the speed of relevancy. I know that's a term that's been out there, but uh, I think it really uh, applies in this instance in that, um, you know, there are a lot of things we can do. Um, and, uh, you know, we're continuing to contemplate what those things are doing instead of starting to take some action. Um, you know, right now the possibilities are, are pretty large and you know, we need to, to get a little bit of focus out there so we can quickly mature platforms and get some of this capability fielded while we continue to figure out what the next generation of those capabilities could be. So some of the challenges with that, I guess, lead to, you know, helping as a community figure out where our focus needs to be, uh, aligning the budgets that uh, are, are needed, um, you know, so that we can actually make that progress. And the fact that we have uncertainty, we don't have solidified budgets. You look at someone like myself that's representing uh, a company, when we look at those two elements, that provides an awful lot of uncertainty in our business uh, cases. So it really doesn't bode well for us to invest in something that carries a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, really looking for those, those three pieces uh, or four pieces that come together, uh, a little better clarity of where we need to go uh, roadmaps and plans that are aligned with that so that we as a company in partnership with the government can align and rally behind those roadmaps to get some parts and, and uh, vehicles flying. Yeah, very well said. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes left, but you bring up, a, all three of you bring up a, a pretty good insight that uh, the government, uh, Department of the Air Force in particular, might be able to do better telling industry or communicating with industry uh, about clear choices and going in a direction and uh, getting to pro procurement. Any, any last minute comments on that from industry? Yeah, I think we're living in a really exciting time. So from our perspective, for the first time, we have all the technology building blocks in order to make this happen. And when we look out in the room, right, selection bias of those of you who chose to spend some time in this room today during this panel, the folks here are going to be the folks that decide what the next 100 years of aviation look like. The previous 100 years are built around a human pilot. Unequivocally, the next 100 years are built around human pilots plus autonomy. We are at a pivotal moment where the technology is available, and it is our collective choice about what to be able to go do with it. And if we make small incremental progress towards that incredibly important end goal, to be able to go make our skies more, to make our skies safer, and to make airplanes safer for our pilots, the opportunities are absolutely endless. But if we delay making those hard choices to be able to get to that future, we cede the definition of that future to somebody else. And we're working really, really hard at Merlin to be able to go define what that future is in collaboration with a lot of folks in this room. But that's the imperative that we all have. Well said. I'll cap it at I, that. Well, I guess I would just uh, conclude by saying uh, I, th I think the Air Force has done an amazing job of working with industry, you know, our, our company included. I applaud you for being very open with industry and doing an excellent job of really describing how you see future conflicts playing out and what types of things you'll need to include the area of unmanned systems and autonomous systems and kind of how you envision using those. I, th I think to really move forward, the next step is going to be to actually lay out acquisition strategies to acquire those things and timelines and w when will there be competitions and, and when will there be contract awards because that's, that's really what's going to allow industry to align their investments to have the products ready for the competitions. Thanks, Mark. Anything, Steve? Yeah, I, and, uh, I, I agree with both the other panel members here. I meant the, the conversations um, the dialogue up to this point in time have been, uh, you know, really productive in terms of describing, you know, what the art of the possible is. Um, it is time at, at, you know, at this point in time to kind of translate that into, 
acquisition strategies, roadmaps, and the like. You know, we as a, a company are, are making small, medium-sized, large bets on, I say, our read of, of the situation. Um, again, kind of walking into a little cloud of uncertainty. The more we can clarify, uh, you know, kind of where we need to go, what those plans will be, what those programs or records will be, uh, that'll help align where we go. It'll help, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, light the fire behind our butts so that we can move more quickly. Um, so those things are needed. Uh, again, to you know, you look at the situation. We have to move faster, and we have to move now. Very good. Well, thanks to Merlin Labs and Elbit and Pratt and Whitney for your participation today, gents. Uh, thank you for being on the panel. That concludes our panel. I do want to give. We're about 20 seconds over. There is another um, event today. Unmanned teaming, myth and reality. It'll be here in Potomac C at 1545, hosted by Mitchell's own Heather Penny. And uh, it extends this in great depth, this conversation into uh, some other areas that I think you all enjoy. So thanks for all your service. This concludes the panel. <laughs>